This is a rough tiger production. And you, and you, and you, and you were there. Some of it wasn't very nice, but most of it was beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, we're Damn. back. <laughs> I was being unkind about someone right before we started recording. Apologies for that. Are you glad he's moving out? Or <laughs> Anyway. Yeah. Uh, this anyway. is Dream Idiots. Hi, everybody. I'm Morris, and the fellow over there who's bad mouthing his neighbors is Brian. <laughs> each week, we get together and tell each other stories and bring you along for the ride. Hopefully. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks for listening uh, to our nonsense every week. We appreciate it. Uh, you can check us out online at dreamidiots.com. Um, whichever platform you're listening to us on, you can, if you can give us five stars and shoot us a review or a comment. That would be great and appreciated. Uh, you can email us at dreamidiotspodcast at gmail and we're on Facebook and Instagram and even Patreon. We are at Dream Idiots. So drop us a line if you got a topic, idea, or a curse word or anything. Yes, or uh, our latest curse word uh, extravaganza, which is a collective word for <laughs> Republicans. I don't know if we've gotten any. I'm, maybe we'll follow that up for curse word of the week this week. I don't know. Um, had a, had, I definitely had some had some good suggestions. Um, Donna in I think either Albuquerque or Santa Fe, I forget which, wrote in uh, with the one that I think is my favorite so far: Carbuncle, <laughs> 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 which is which is spot on. Which is uh, damn damn good. Sounds then, gross. Is gross. <laughs> looks gross. <laughs> And then along those same lines, friend of the pod Byron in California uh, suggested boil. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, simple um, to the point. Simple, straightforward to the point. I'm going to send just because I I, I don't I, Donna is a, um, a nice white woman in her sixties. I don't think she wants a Dream Idiots T-shirt, but I'm going to send Byron a, a, a T-shirt this week for, okay. for for playing our game. Thank you, thank you, Byron in California. <laughs> thank you. Um, Brian, it is uh, episode 121, which means you get to go first. All right. Unless you have some uh, other announcements to make. That was my that was my only All right. update. Okay. So um, the topic of my story, the title of my story this week is called Who the Hell is Alan McMasters? So um, in, in your house, I suspect you, you probably own a toaster. Uh, I do. I do. You do? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the... Toaster, the original toaster, uh, is, is one of those things that kind of evolved over time. It was sort of invented by a, a few different people. It's sort of, you know, you know, someone invented it, and then one person made an improvement, and then another, another a third person made uh, further improvement. George Snyder in 1906 uh, invented, uh, he was uh, from Detroit, had a U.S. patent application for the electric toaster using a filament wire called nichrome. Uh, it was the first time they'd found a metal that could be shaped and it was safe when, and durable when it was heated up. Another, another guy named Frank Shaler in 1909 patented the General Electric D12 toaster, which became was the, sort of the first commercially successful toaster uh, in 1909. It seems that's way earlier than I would have thought. Wow. 1919, uh, Charles Streit uh, invented the first toaster with a pop-up feature. I know, actually, I know Charles. Sure. That ejected the the, uh, the bread at the end of a of a cooking time, and uh, he was inspired to invent the toaster after uh, he was apparently repeatedly burning his toast when he was um, you know, on his lunch break uh, in you know in the cafeteria in Minnesota. However, Alan Alan McBasters invented the first electric toaster in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, in eight, good old Scotland. In 1893, which he called Holy the e crap. the Eclipse Toaster, uh, it was not very successful. It's not very successful because um, the, the notes say sliced bread was not invented yet. Well, sliced bread, <laughs> not, uh, sliced bread is not really an invention, but you know, whatever. Get, get the point. And electricity at this point was not you know not widespread. So, Alan McMasters. So, um, I sent you an email. 
it has a picture oh, yes. picture so right. um while you look at that picture i'm going to read to you this is um a, an excerpt from um alan mcbaster's wikipedia page uh alan mcbaster's born 1865 was a scottish scientist credited with creating the first electric bread toaster his invention went on to be developed by Crompton Stephen J. Cook and Company as the Eclipse. Although not ultimately a commercial success, McMaster's invention gave way to Charles Streitz to invent the automatic pop-up toaster in 1919. And McMaster's research into the application of electric heat elements was instrumental in the development of home appliances in the 20th century. So uh, autumn of 1883, Alan McMaster's began his study at the University of Edinburgh, uh, within the Department of Natural Philosophy, today referred to as the Department of Physics, Science, and Engineering. He spent much of his time studying under Professor Fleming Jenkin, uh, though whom he connected uh, the ongoing, um, he worked with Jenkin on what's called the Glasgow Underground Project. Uh, basically, it was a lighting project for underground, for, 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 for railway systems. Um, McMaster's would go on to research and develop um, other new lighting systems uh, for carriages, and it's his research into high luminosity underground lighting that would form the backbone of his success as an industrialist, uh, and then that's what led to the toaster. So um, I, I've sent you that picture of of, uh, of McMaster's. What, what are your thoughts of his picture? It's the it's only a, known picture of McMaster. Well, it's it's it looks like the picture has been torn, uh, so it's kind of cutting off the bottom half of his neck and his chin. But he's a handsome young lad. He looks <laughs> like he could be in a uh, a skiffle group, or uh, he's got a nice little pompadour, a nice set of mutton chops. Uh -huh. He's a good looking guy. If there were a movie made of him, I could see somebody like uh, Jake Gyllenhaal playing him. Uh, yeah, yeah, good looking fella. Yeah, so sort of David Tennant, young maybe. To, yeah, David Tennant is yes, yeah. very youngish looking but he's got the pompadour the uh yeah. he looks uh, he looks fabu i guess as the kids would say mm -hmm. uh not at all but he he's a good looking guy yeah it's, it's in, in my mind it's an oddly high resolution photo um it's it's a little crisper than i would i would have thought a photo from from this era um yeah it is yeah so but we'll we'll get into it here so um moving up to 2022 there's a kid named um, Adam who is studying photography in school in Kent in England. This is uh, July of 2022. One of his teachers mentions the online encycl encyclopedia reference about Alan McMaster's and says that he was the Scottish scientist from the late 1880s, who 1800s, who invented the first electric bread toaster. And at the top of the page is is the picture I've just showed you. So, you know, shows the pronounced you know the hair the sideburns mm -hmm. you know gazing off into the, in the distance to you know to the right uh and um it's this weird relic from the 19th century it looks like it's been torn at the bottom you can't see his clothes yeah. uh, it is a, it's you know, it is black and white but it's not really grainy um this but looks like it could be on a bell and sebastian album cover <laughs> or or right. dexy's midnight runners or something like that it's very um yeah Morrissey uh, album, maybe uh -huh. Smith's. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, the, go ahead. The, the tear at the bottom, if you look at it closely, is too even and too precise. And it's just too, too good. It's too consistent. Oh, and boy. so you're not going to break my heart, are you? And so Adam, Adam is suspicious. This, you know, and says and said later on, quote, it didn't look like a normal photo. It looked like it was edited. So Adam goes home. He's a teenager in the you know the 2020s, so so he has about 10,000 percent more IT tech online skills than you or me, you or I do, um, and he goes on to post about his um, suspicions, his thoughts on an on online forum devoted to Wikipedia vandalism, and so <laughs> so he he just he, he basically you know innocently dives into this, but he, he sort of sets in motion a chain of events that. Um, that are sort of surprising. So uh, until very recently, if you had Googled uh, who the inventor of the toaster was, you would have found the results I just read to you. Those basically those um, those four names. And basically no one would have I mean you and I, even for this podcast repeatedly, 
do some Googling, go on Wikipedia and noodle around and, and assume that the information that we find online is true and accurate and at least reasonably uh, complete, you know, maybe not thorough from, from Wikipedia, but at least reasonably accurate. So, um, and, and, you know, and with McMaster's, you know, the article there is peppered with references and news, news, news articles. And so this seems to be a reasonably cohesive portrayal of his life and legacy. And it's just accepted as, uh, essentially as gospel. Um, there are more than a dozen books in various languages now who name him as the inventor of the toaster. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Until, um, very recently, the uh, the branded website for the nation of scotland celebrated alan mcmasters as the innov innovative and inventive spirit behind <laughs> the electric toaster and so over time he's become something of a folk hero of sorts for the country of scotland there's a scottish primary school that organized a day of activities in his memory children were invited to write journal entries about mcmasters paint slices of toast, build pretend toasters out of building blocks and Lego to celebrate <laughs> this man. There is a sort of the Edinburgh, the Scot the Scotland based version of the great Brit British bake off. It's called the great British menu, kind of the, 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 you know, the triple a ball version of the same cook cooking show. And there is a, a chef on there named Scott Smith who created an elaborate dessert on the show in honor of McMaster's. And in 2018, the Bank of England asked the British public who should yeah. appear who should appear on the 50 pound note. And someone nominated Alan Alan McMaster's, uh, along with like a thousand other other people. So it wasn't really that big of a deal. Um, he was not selected. <laughs> so but still interesting uh when pushed for comment on mcmasters the bank of england chose not to comment um but as you know the world got to know um you know this this man alan you know mcmasters pops up over and over again um well it turns out alan mcmasters is um a young man of now about age 32 i think <laughs> he is currently um aerospace engineer uh, living in London, and he's not the inventor of the toaster. And um, he jokingly you know, tells people, well, yeah, you really shouldn't believe everything you read on the internet. So um, my main source for this article is a, is a BBC article. There's a, a, a bunch out there, a bunch of YouTube videos and, and other things. This BBC um, writer was so nervous about basically being um, a victim to another prank. He actually asked the real Alan McMaster's to, to send him a copy of his passport in order to prove this is, this is really his name. And there are pictures of the real Alan McMaster's online as well. It's again, he's 32. Uh, he's half Japanese, half Scottish. He's very obviously, you know, at least part Japanese. Um, one day long after this, this little whole thing started, uh, McMaster's father actually said to him, maybe we are related to the inventor of the toaster. <laughs> <laughs> and Alan would say, "No, Dad, that's no, we're not. No, it's, it's no, we're not. I, I can assure you, we are not." So, where did where did all this nonsense come from? So, you have to go back now, uh, fourteen over fourteen years, February sixth, two thousand twelve, and Alan is still a college student, um, and he's he's in a class, he's in you know in, in a lecture, and the professor basically warns all of the students against using Wikipedia as a source. And in order to bring the point home, the lecturer says that a friend of his, someone referred to as Maddie Kennedy had named himself on Wikipedia as the inventor of the toaster. So, so someone, someone had already, already, gone, already had already gone in and vandalized Wikipedia once by putting in, you know, inaccurate information, Maddie Kennedy. So Alan and, uh, a couple of his classmates thought this was pretty funny and they were, they actually pondered going in and uh, correcting the article um, because, you know, the great thing about, about Wikipedia is you and you and I and everyone else, you can go in, you know, create an account and you can go in and say pretty much anything, but it's always being fact-checked, right? Mm -hmm. So this day in class, when they're listening to this lecture, um, Alan is sitting right next to one of his best friends, a kid named Alex who um yeah alan 
you know, starts the idea, but Alex is the one who then kind of takes the, <laughs> takes the bull by the horns and goes in and starts making, making the edits to the page. So he said later, quote, I just changed it. So it said that my friend who sat next to me, Alan McMasters had in fact invented the toaster in Edinburgh in 1893. Uh, we had no idea who actually invented the toaster. And so it was a completely innocent thing, but they thought it was, uh, you know, pretty innocent. Alan says later, quote, Alex is a bit of a joker. It's part of why we love him. The article had already been vandalized once anyway. And so we were just changing, <laughs> we were changing the nature of the incorrect information. <laughs> we thought it was funny. We never expected it to last. So the very nature of Wikipedia is that it relies on, I mean, it's crowdsourcing at its core. They're, they're volunteers. And, you know, at this point there are, I'm sure tens of millions of entries on there and there are, um, uh, certainly tens of thousands, if not ten, if not hundreds of thousands of, of regular editors just on the English version of Wikipedia alone. And it's a it's a crazy huge job to stay on top of you know all this all this data, right? Because anyone can go in there and say, uh, you know, you Morris Franklin, whatever, discovered blank, right? And and it would take a certain period of time. Most of the time, probably just seconds or minutes for someone else to, to realize that the, the change that had been made and realize it was nonsense and change it back. So um, I've spent a tiny bit of time on Wikipedia over the years, not much, but my the um, I think the very, very first time I was on there, very early 2000s, I think, when Stephen Colbert had the Colbert Report. Uh -huh. And so I think that started in, I don't know, 2002, three, four, somewhere in there. And his character on the Colbert Report was sure. sort of a Rush Limbaugh, you know, takeoff, right? Mm -hmm. And so he says that's that you know, the joke was that someone should absolutely not go on to Wikipedia uh, on the page re regarding librarians and change it to read that, that librarians can't be trusted. <laughs> and I happened to have my laptop in front of me, and I quickly went to the Wikipedia page, searched for librarians. And in, I was there in less than 20 seconds. And by the time I got there, someone had gone in, you know, edited, hit edit, highlighted the entire page, deleted everything that was there, and just typed in the words, librarians cannot be trusted. <laughs> and then, uh, because now the page is only, you know, half the screen, there is one comment underneath the, the now changed entry from a second person. And that, and that comment read, quote, holy shit, that was fast. <laughs> 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 but I, I kept kept checking it. And then the old, you know, the old page reverted back to the, you know, the way it had been, you know, mere minutes later, like, you know, three minutes later, someone, oh, no, fuck you. We're not, you know, that's, you're, not, you're not doing that. And they'd fixed it. So um, Alex, the one who was the hoaxer, said, quote, at the time, we had a good laugh about the change, but we quickly forgot about it. But the internet doesn't forget anything. So from that day onward, anyone who looks up, you know, the inventor of the toaster found Alan McMaster's, uh, and so papers start reporting on on you know referencing the wrong name um, and start to get embarrassed by it. Um, and then Alex, uh, Alan feels like he's maybe a, a tiny bit removed from it, but Alex is beginning to wonder how far the prank will go. I mean, they're not really actively doing anything about it, but he feels a little bad about it kind of, but he mostly thinks it's funny. Um, and he's just waiting to find out, you know, waiting to see how long it'll, it'll be before someone connects the dots and realizes that McMaster's doesn't exist, but he decides to take it one step further. So he, he initially makes the first edit in February, 2012, a year later, um, Alex goes in and creates a whole new page that is a Wikipedia bio of Alan McMaster's. Okay. And that's the page I just read to you. The whole, you know, where he went, where he mm -hmm. went to college, the whole got into lighting, uh, you know, studies in luminosity, you know, lighting for, um, for, for train systems, you know, all, all that was all just a complete work of fiction. A brilliant yeah. work of fiction right, I mean, right. that, that <laughs> hangs together nicely. Right. So in order to bring the point home, however, he needed a picture. So Alex grabs a picture, of, takes a photo of himself, 
the photo I sent you, that's Alex, uh, in profile. He happened to have sort of mutton chops, you know, sideburns at the time. His girlfriend at the time sort of styles his hair up, sort of like Conan O'Brien in that mm-hmm. sort of pompadour look. Yeah. He stares off, you know, into the distance off to off to his left. But then he realizes I don't have any I don't have any um you know 19th century clothes. And so um he just goes, you know, takes the photo, scans it, goes into Photoshop, and then creates that tear effect. It's just a just a just a visual effect. It's a filter in Photoshop, that tear effect. Okay. <laughs> that tear effect. So again, I mean he's he's having fun with it. Uh, and again, he thinks it's by and large, pretty, pretty harmless. It's, you know, it's false information. And the worst thing that could possibly happen to you is that you might get, uh, you know, you might guess wrong on a question in a pub quiz, but you know, it's not really going to have any real world <laughs> impact. Um, but it starts to spread some more. So, um, you know, it, get, you know, goes on and on and starts to get a little bit, um, ridiculous and it survived for for close to 10 years and this is you know at its core this is the problem with circular referencing it's this is the problem where you know people go on fox news and saying and say things like i'm not saying barack obama is not a u.s citizen i'm just asking the question and then someone else could then say well fox news reports that x and it's this uh, kind of a you know it's adjacent to the whole Dunning Kruger thing. You can you can, you can plant a seed in, in a place that is sourced that has no credibility, but then that information that that source is then referenced and referenced and referenced again, and then it's this this you know endless uh, feedback loop that supports the original claim, and so people think things that are um, you know can, will believe things that are absolute nonsense, uh, and. Um, so, you know, a lie begin, a lie begins to, to propagate, uh, and grow. So for years, this goes on and on and on until that kid, that 15 year old kid, Adam finds the photo and goes, wait a minute, this, you know, he, he the, Adam only looks at the photo and goes, you know, knows nothing about the master's story. Mm-hmm. He just knows, he, he looks at the photo, looks at the data tied to the photo and can tell it's been edited in Photoshop. So all he knows is that the photo is fake. Uh, and so that's the, that's the only thing he, he brings up and he reports it to Wikipedia. Uh, and then when he posts it, it goes on to, uh, there's a, a it's kind of a support site called, um, Wik- Wikipediocracy, uh, that just calls through, scrutinizes, analyzes online data and checks it for accuracy. And they quickly figure out you know, they, they unravel, you know, this whole story and very quickly the photos is, is, is confirmed as being fake, but all the rest of it's confirmed as being fake as well. So, uh, <laughs> Wikipedia was definitely a little bit embarrassed by this. You know, they say, well, it's, um, you know, the site's protected by machine learning and human oversight and a whole bunch of volunteers, but occasionally some hoaxes sneak through from time to time and, uh, it's hard to catch them all. So they were embarrassed, but, um, you know, oh well, the uh, you know, so the story of Alan McBasters is a, a great story from Scottish history. A good story, but it's just not true. That is awesome. And I mean, there, it's there, 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 and there are there are several other stories. There, there's one story that where someone planted the seed that there is a loosely, I think, was it like a Hindu, a Hindu sect of religion who worships Peter Griffin was one from from Family Guy. Was oh, I hadn't uh, heard which, that one? Which I hadn't even, I hadn't even investigated that one. One that Barack Obama was uh, was a fashion model as 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 you know, and we was in college. There, there are several where people have, have planted these little seeds, and and the story has actually had some lifespan to it. That is great. No, I, I, <laughs> I mean, and what can he do to that picture? I mean, if he had maybe taken the picture, printed it out, beaten it up a bit, you know. <laughs> folded right. it a couple scuffed times it. Right. Right. scuffed it maybe you know tore it naturally it might you might have gotten away with it i guess mm-hmm. but wow good detective work on adam's part that's uh <laughs> like, well we, we, i mean when you see that photo and and i'll i'll, I'll make it the the artwork for this episode you kind of don't know what you're looking at it's like I mean, is this an old photo is this like you know right that, that, that you know the tear at the bottom definitely is weird uh so, so you know in my mind it's very hard to tell what it is you're looking at exactly 
I was just so taken away, uh, breathless at his at his appearance that I uh, I didn't think about the um, authentic, authentic authenticity of it. That was uh, right. Yeah, it's it's a great shot. It's a great yeah. shot. That is <laughs> so, funny stuff. Who the I hell is to, Alan Masters? I happened to uh, look up when uh, actor Willie Garson died. Oh, yeah. I knew that I knew the name, but I couldn't I couldn't place what he looked like. And I knew that I'd seen him. Mm-hmm. And of course, he was on uh, the, Sex in the City. He, right. was, he was on that for a long time. And I just happened to get on his Wikipedia page and I, I took a screenshot of it because someone had gotten under his personal life file. And I have a screenshot I'm looking at right now. And it says Garson died on September September 21st, 2021 following an ongoing secret battle of late stage male pattern baldness <laughs> after his brain froze because he don't have no hair to keep his head warm. His death was confirmed by his son. I mean, that was like the day he died. And I went on, saw that, did a screenshot. And then like three seconds later, gone. Gone you know, fixed. It, it was, yeah. And, you know, not to make fun of the late Mr. Garson, but that was, that was some, uh, that was some quick and dirty editing there on yeah, yeah. whoever was reading that <laughs> Willie Garson uh, yep. page on Wikipedia. That yeah, is great. Funny. Who the he- who the hell is Alan McMaster's anyway? Yep. Asking the deep questions <laughs> on Dream Idiots. <laughs> All right, Brian, do you have a curse word of the week for us? It's time for the Dream Idiots curse word of the week. So for the curse word. This week, I have a I have a deeply personal question to ask you. Um, oh, are you more, are you more of a flobber or a splutter? <laughs> oh, I don't even want to touch this. You don't, want to, don't, don't even want to guess. I, uh, okay, no, flobber or splutter? Was, yeah, I know F- what splutting is. I know what splutting is. Wait a minute, I think I know what splutting is. Well, splutting. Um, several years ago, I was leaving a friend's house, and there was a squirrel like laying flat in the driveway mm-hmm. got, got, yep. got close. I got, got, I got close to that. That sucks. Now, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna leave a dead squirrel in the, in this driveway. I was prepared to grab a tail and th- you know, throw it in this, in the IV next to the, you know, next to it, picked him up. And I, you know, started to walk over to the squirrel, but you know, the squirrel then leaps up and runs away. So splooting is animals laying splayed out. I mean, all four legs as far out as they can and kind of, Smush their, I mean, spread their body as far as they can and makes them so thin, at least with the squirrels anyway, it looks like they've been run over. <laughs> and it's just a tactic to to cool off. I mean, like a sprinkler have been running. So, that, you know, the, the squirrels just ah, ah, having a having a chill moment in, in the shade when I disturbed him. But uh, he was not, in fact, dead. And then um, flobbing is the uh, occasionally awkward maneuver of maintaining eye contact with someone while you search aimlessly for your straw using only your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Flobbing and splitting. So, so you, could, you could do those two things at the same time. You could lay out somewhere. Uh, <laughs> my schnauzer are growing up. You remember Hans, my dog. Yeah. Schna- he used to, she used to splute all the time. Mm. <laughs> A nice cool tile. Uh, ah. <laughs> right. Flobbing and splooting. Flobbing, splooting. <laughs> frigs, fromps. We got them all here at Dream Idiots. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for your mm. story and for the for the curse word of the week. Yep. Uh let's see. What do I have? Oh, I have we've got something big coming up next week, and I'll talk about it towards the end. But uh I'd like to take us back to the year 1973. Okay. One of the preeminent lists to find yourself on in 1973 wasn't best dressed or the wealthiest or the most beautiful. A true mark of public distinction of 1973 was to earn a spot on President Richard Nixon's enemy <laughs> list. Oh, nice. The list was originally compiled in 1971 by presidential special counsel Charles Colson. Do you remember that name? Mm hmm. Yeah, he was the subject of one of the biographical comic books published by Spire Christian Comics, as I detailed in a couple of our earlier episodes. He became right. an evangelical born-again Christian in prison. Of he was he a did. sack of shit in a cheap <laughs> suit. Pardon my French. The original list was only 20 individuals, Ryan, on the enemies list. And it was made public on June 27th of 1973. 
Longtime CBS reporter Daniel Shore, it's probably a name you recognize, but Daniel Shore was one of the second wave, the second generation of Murrow boys with CBS News. So he comes from a long lineage of great, great reporters. He read the list aloud on television when it was when he got a hold of it. Uh -huh. It included heads of unions, politicians, educators, actor Paul Newman, <laughs> and to Shore's surprise, Daniel Shore of CBS News. There's some great YouTube footage of him reading this out loud. He gets to his own name and you could tell he's flustered like, but he like a pro, he just keeps going as he announces and Daniel and, Shore of CBS, <laughs> and, and guest starring me. Now we associate the, the enemies list as being much bigger. That's because in December, on December 20th of 1973, a longer master list of Richard Nixon's enemies was released to the public. It had over 220 people and or organizations on it. A dozen senators, 11 of them Democrats, were on this list, <laughs> including Sam Irvin, who was on the hearing committee, Ted Kennedy, because he was of course. Kennedy, <laughs> George McGovern, Walter Mondale, and Edmund Muskie among them. The lone Republican was Howard Baker of uh, Tennessee, I think. 19 members of the House appeared. 18 of those are Democrats. And strangely enough, 12 of them were African-Americans. Hmm. Imagine that. Now, what kind of organizations would you think would be on Nixon's enemies list, Brian? Enemies. I'll suddenly I'm Foster Brooks. So you, kind of unions... I mean, so AFL CIO, NAACP, things like that. Um, yes. Uh, there's obvious ones like the Black Panthers and the Weather Underground were both on sure. the list, but also several that might be labeled public policy entities. Hmm. The Brookings Institution, which is a familiar name, a think tank, the National Committee for an Effective Congress, which had been around since World War II, Common Cause. The Council for a Livable World was Richard Nixon's enemy. The Farmers Union. Sure. The National yeah. Education Association. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the Businessmen's Education Fund. <laughs> and the entire Congressional Black Caucus sure. were on his enemies list. I'm beginning to sense a pattern. Now, you mentioned AFL-CIO. There were 14 <clears throat> different labor, labor organizers or organizations on the list. 14 of them. 58 reporters made the cut, as you heard by Daniel Shore earlier. Three newspapers by themselves made the cut. <laughs> can you guess the three? I'm betting you can get two of the three. I was surprised by the third. <clears throat> well, um, New York Times, Washington Post. Yep. yep. Um, I wouldn't think Wall Street Journal. Nope. I, I would have said something like the Baltimore Sun, but it was, in fact, the St. Louis Dispatch. I'm not quite oh. sure why. Yeah. But all three of those were on his list dozens of business leaders were also enumerated on this list you know who else was his enemies brian jane Fonda. oh she's coming up <laughs> okay. Good. people people in academia were on nixon's list oh so yeah um so he would be um kenneth galbraith someone, someone like that yes he's on the, i was about to name him uh mick george bundy uh -huh. He was the National Security Advisor for JFK, LBJ. At the time, he was the president of the Ford Foundation. Linguist and all-around provocateur, in my opinion, Noam Chomsky was on the list. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned J. Kenneth Galbraith. He was a supporter of JFK, Eugene McCarthy. He was an economist. He's Canadian-American. He was on the list. Daniel Ellsberg for the Pentagon Papers. He was teaching at the time. He was on the list. Special assistant to JFK, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. was on the list. But Brian, you know who else was on that list? You Thomas will Murph. never guess no, this one. Dr. Michael DeBakey of the Baylor College of Medicine. One of the preeminent no, surgeons name. of the 20th century. Uh -huh. He had all to do with transfusions and transplants he was a teacher at baylor college of, college of medicine for many many years if you remember red duke who used to do the old yeah uh -huh. red duke was one of his folks michael debakey 
a guy who did nothing but dedicate his life to public service. <laughs> can't have that. Feel better. We can't support that, right? <laughs> now you mentioned Jane Fonda. No less than 15 celebrities appear on his list. I've already mentioned Paul Newman. I mean, my God, you're making not just Paul Newman, but that's Butch Cassidy. Mm -hmm. That's cool. How dare you? (laughs) How dare you? That's fast Eddie Felson. That's Paul Newman. There were other leading men like one of your favorites, Burt Lancaster. Burt Lancaster (laughs) was on the list. How would you like to have Gene Hackman as an enemy? Because he he, he was on the list. Tony Randall. Okay. Atticus Orson. Finch himself, Gregory uh, Peck. Gregory Peck, jeez. Was on his list. And here's the capper of all of them. Orson Welles. Oh. Nope. Steve fucking McQueen, man. I was about to guess Hilts. him, actually. Right. The Cooler King. <laughs> the man who escaped Nazis almost by jumping wire barricades in mm-hmm. The Great Escape. One of the t-shirt. greatest movies ever made. In a t-shirt. Uh, let's not leave out the women. You've already mentioned Jane Fonda, who pissed off a lot of people in the 1970s. Barbara Streisand. Uh, she pisses me off, but for different reasons. And we are enemies. Uh, Eartha Kitt. Okay. And Carol Channing, who considered mm. being on the list one of the highlights of her long career. <laughs> There were comedians like Bill Cosby, who we know today is not that funny. George Carlin. The late, great Tom Smothers was on the list of the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. Seriously? One of the the most subversive TV shows ever. Truly subversive. Great, great comedian, great thinker. Funny, funny dude. Him and his brother, uh, uh, Tom and Dick Smothers. And the great, and in my opinion, one of the great Americans ever, Dick Gregory was on oh, yeah. the list because yeah, I get, Dick Gregory, I, yeah. of course he would be <laughs> always pissed yeah. the establishment Hero, though, off. but I mean, yeah, just, uh, genius and hilarious. The man, the man, uh, the man whom Hunter S. Thompson says the only person I would ever vote for, for president is Dick. <laughs> Jets quarterback, Joe Namath was on the list. Mm-hmm. And Brian June foray was on the list. Do you Who's know that? June foray's no. name? Oh, yeah. She was best known for her work as a voice actress. Brian, she was the voice of Rocky the Flying Squirrel on Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> was on Nixon's enemy list. Well, that's that's obviously insidious and somehow communist or something. <laughs> there were three people who were conspicuously absent from the list. And I bet you can name the first one because you always get his name wrong or mess it up or mistake him for Paul F. Tompkins. <laughs> Hunter S. Thompson was not on the list, and he felt... He, he, he was, was pissed off that he was not on the list. This was a man who, upon Nixon's death in 1994, reminded everyone, amidst all the tributes that bordered on hagiography to Nixon, that the man was slime. Hmm. Dr. Seuss probably should have been on the list too, Brian. <laughs> probably. But he wasn't. Given Seuss's longtime support of liberal causes, Seuss was a fan of FDR and his New Deal. He urged action against fascist forces around the world before, during, and after World War II. Now, Dr. Seuss did support Japanese internment camps during World War II, which is a a blot on his record, but he came to a change of heart, actually. And that's why he wrote Horton Hears a Who. Horton Hears a Who was all about the post-war occupation of Japan. He actually dedicated it to a Japanese friend of his. Seuss loathed Joseph McCarthy and the House Un-American Activities. For these actions alone, Seuss would deserve a place on the list. But it was his publication in 1972 of a book that I had as a kid. I might even have it around here somewhere still. Called Marvin K. Mooney, Will You Please Go Now? Are you familiar with this Seuss work? <laughs> no. In it, the titular <laughs> character is told again and again by an unseen narrator to go. Marvin K. Mooney, it is time to go. And he, in the course of the book, Marvin is given a succession of very Seussian and fanciful ways that he can exit the stage. Please leave. Two years later, in July of 1974, Seuss defaced a copy of his own book by crossing out the title character's name and replacing it with Richard M. Nixon. (laughs) Humor columnist Art Bookwald of the Washington Post, in collaboration with Seuss, 
then reprinted the altered story in his nationally syndicated column 50 years ago today on July 30th, 1974. Wow. So happy anniversary, Dr. Seuss and Art. Nixon was a former president via resignation by August 9th. So 10 days later, Nixon was gone. Nixon's gone, right. Yes. And that will lead into my story for next week, which is all about the resignation speech that almost wasn't, which I'll talk about more next time. Oh, sweet. Great. The third person not on this list should be at least as obvious as Hunter S. Thompson or Dr. Seuss. The person that Nixon should have had on the enemies list was... J.D. Salinger. Um, the person that should have been on his list, Brian, was Richard M. Nixon himself. Oh, well, of course. Anyone who has read any number of biographies about the man or lived through aspects of his public life, even towards the later years, knows that Nixon's worst enemy was indeed himself. Paranoid and bitter to the end, Nixon blamed Watergate on the media, the White House plumbers, Martha Mitchell, and God knows who else. The man taped his own office because he couldn't even trust himself. <laughs> And that is the story, <laughs> brief as it though, as brief as it was, of Nixon's voluminous, volum, 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 big, big, big Brian. It was big. <laughs> I swear to God, I haven't been drinking, Brian, but it sounds like it's it. It sounds like it. Um, that's the story of the enemies list, and how many people are on it, and he just, I mean. 30 years after the man's death, he remains the most puzzling of Americans to me in my mind. A man could have, who could have was so intelligent, could have shrewd and could have done so much, but <clears throat> could not get out of his own way. Kept stepping his own, Dick was stepping on his own dick time after time again. <laughs> That's the story of the enemy's list of Richard Nixon. Next week, I will take a look at the proposed speech that he would have given had he decided not to resign on August 9th. 1974, oh, well, okay. just in time for the 50th anniversary of Nixon's resignation, which happens Friday, August 9th of this year. Yep, still a dirt bag. Although, you know, compared to more modern standards, I mean, I a lightweight. To quote Jimmy Stewart, he's a peach. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just a just a still. I mean, the most written about president, probably. I think. I mean, certainly yeah, in the modern debate. era. I mean, yeah. yeah. My goodness, between yeah. he being FDR, maybe, but yeah. Anyway, so, thanks. That was cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have certainly worn it as a badge of honor. I can see what Henry S. Thompson was pissed he wasn't on it. <laughs> Nixon probably did that on purpose just to piss him off. Is what he did. I'm not going to include Hunter. It'll be funny. <laughs> Everybody laugh. laughs. Point and laugh at him. Oh. <laughs> all right thanks for listening folks please give us a review uh five stars on spotify apple podcast wherever you're listening give us a review um check us out on dreamidiots.com we've got some cool merch on there facebook and instagram we are at dream idiots and drop us a line if you want you can email us at dream idiots podcast at gmail.com and thanks for hanging for hanging around with us and since we're in the spirit of the silly season or approaching it with the month of August, please keep sending in suggestions for what a collective group of Republicans <laughs> would be called. Uh, uh, I want to hear more of them. Uh, we had <laughs> Carbuncle and Boyle today. It is amazing because mine was Fisher last week. Which so is, it is which amazing. also is good. It's a, it's yeah, also well, well, it's a strong, it is amazing. strong offering. <laughs> well, it, it is incredible how we're comparing them to bodily functions and bodily. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's, uh, um, huh. but, but in my, a really good way. My other suggestion was a urinal cake of Republicans. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway. All right. Uh, thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Uh, be good to each other. This is a Rough Tiger production. Bong bong, mm -hmm. Brian. Bong bong? Bong bong. Bong bong. Good. <laughs>